Man, hey, that was some worship there tonight. Give them one more round. I know that's not why you do it, and that's not why you're here tonight for the applause. But but we appreciate it. Have you guys been blessed by Impact this week, the Impact 19? How many guys, how many of y'all have been here every every night of this? Wow, that's that's awesome. So we have been so extremely blessed with uh, with our musical guests when the Irwins were here, when Peyton Neal was here tonight. We've been so blessed by some powerful preaching by Brother Dennis and, and Brother Malcolm. And uh, so now, here's here's how we're going to wrap this all up. You know, at the end of the game, when your team is up 40, 50 points, and they put in the third string, <laughs> like they just run out the clock kind of situation. That's what you got with me tonight. <laughs> But what I want to do very intentionally is just wrap a bow on the end of this. I want to take everything that we have heard from Impact this week, and I want to take this and, and make it practical. Look and say, how can I make an impact in my situation right now? What can I do in my school? I'm, I'm speaking to everyone, not just to the students here. To my school, in my workplace, in my family, in my home, in my community. How can I make an impact? And we're going to see that. I want, I want us to think through that question tonight. How can I make an impact where I am? We're going to answer that question real briefly tonight. Real briefly tonight. If you know me, you know that. Most likely won't happen. Real briefly tonight, we're going to look at that in a story of a boy named Samuel. So I want you to grab a Bible. I would love every person to be holding a copy of God's Word. If you didn't bring one, that's okay. You can find them in the, in the pew in front of you. Please grab one of those. Make your way. I'll give you some time to find the book of First Samuel. And we'll be in chapter 3. First Samuel chapter 3. What I want to do tonight is explore how he was called, how Samuel was called into ministry. So let's let's go there. Let's talk about this. So Samuel was 12 years old. How many how many of you guys in here? I know 12 is pretty young to be in the youth. You guys are older than 12. OK, you guys, how many are 12? Anybody 12? One. <laughs> right. Well, so glad that. Right. So 12 years old. Samuel, this boy, was 12 years old. And I want you to hear about the, the, the world that he lived in, because I think it sounds pretty similar to the world that we live in today. Let me tell you about his world. He lived in a, in a nation called Israel that had been taken over, had been conquered by a, a, an enemy force. It had been conquered by the Philistines. So he, he was living in an oppressive regime. There was no leadership in the country. Okay, we're not going to get political tonight, right? Bear with me. We're not going to get political. But there was no godly leadership in Israel at that time. In fact... 1 Samuel 18, 1, or Judges 18, 1 says there was no king in Israel. So no godly influence in the government, no godly influence in the church. The religious leaders who were supposed to be leading and teaching people about God were corrupt, greedy, and immoral. Okay, so when you don't have any good leadership, this is what happens to a country. It was fractured, it was divided, and it was lawless. It says in the book of Judges that they glorified violence. They worshipped idols. They constantly wandered from the Lord. This caused problems in society. They were experiencing civil war. So there was, there was political division. There was spiritual division. There was the breakdown of families. Church, we, we are a family-driven and family-reaching church. And we see here in the story of Israel, they didn't care about the family. The family unit was breaking apart. And what that created then was... A society where truth was not being taught. This is what the end of the book of Judges says. Listen to this. Tell me if this doesn't sound like where we live today. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That's the end of the book of Judges. Everybody just did what they thought was right. They said, my truth is just as good as your truth. That's called postmodernism. And it's not actually that modern because we see it thousands of years ago here. But that's the society that this little boy called Samuel, he grew up in. And I tell you, it is not easy to be a Christian in our world today. It's not. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you once you become a Christian and once you are discipled and you grow in your faith that all of a sudden your life is going to be amazing and it's just going to be peaches and cream and everybody's going to love you and everybody's going to say, wow, a Christian, we can trust that guy. We can love that guy. No, it gets harder. It gets harder. And as the world goes on, we know that this world, the preaching that I'm going to do tonight, the preaching of the cross, it says in 1 Corinthians, is foolishness to the world. They don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And so for us here today, this is an important time for us to look and say, Lord, 
I'm going out into a world that is against you and works against you and lives against you. How can I make an impact? How can I do that? How can I do that when I'm terrified to do that? We're going to look at this boy named Samuel. Okay, so did I give you enough time to get there to the book of Samuel? I know we stood for a while, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me to give honor to God's word. We're going to read 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. It says this, the boy Samuel served the Lord. I can just end right there. The boy Samuel served the Lord. So he served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. And prophetic visions were not widespread. That means God was not speaking to people. So one day, Eli, we'll talk about him, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord. How old was he? 12 years old. About 12. Okay, That's, he's in that range. So he was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. And then, here's the fun part. This is where the story picks up. The Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. And then look what he does. He runs, it says in, in verse 4, he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. Now who had called Samuel? God had called Samuel. Where did he run to? Eli. Eli. Okay, good. You're, we're on the same page here. Eli replied, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. And once again, verse 6, once again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, here I am. You called me. I didn't call you, my son. He replied, go back and lie down. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He didn't know the, the voice of the Lord. He didn't know who was talking to him. Because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. So he got up, he went to who? Eli and said, here I am. You did call me. And then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then verse 10, this is the best. The Lord came and stood there and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. That's where I want to dig in today. Let me pray and then we'll jump into this. Father, I, can't, I, cannot, I cannot thank you enough for what has happened this week at Impact. I cannot thank you enough for, the, not a cliche, but the impact that it has made on us. <laughs> And on this church, I pray that it would be not just a, a dent, but a crater that, that is, is a testament to what you want to do. You told us what your purpose is in this world. You, the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. And I pray, Lord, with all my heart that we would take what we've heard and put it into practice. That we would be like what Brother Malcolm Ellis preached. That we would be like the wise man who heard the words of Jesus and put them into practice. I pray tonight that you would speak through me, Lord. You know my heart. I pray that you would push me out of the way and make your word and the cross stand above all things. So that's what we would see. We ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So I want to look at three things real quick that, that Samuel did. In this passage that shows us how we can make an impact in the world that we live in, in our situation. The first thing, somebody read out to me the first verse. Just read the first few words there. Don't be shy. Do it. First verse, what does it say? The boy Samuel, serve the Lord. Number one, if you want to make an impact in your community, in your school, in your home, in your family, whatever it may be, you've got to serve the Lord where you are. You got to serve the Lord where we are. There, there, there's people, I think, who are waiting for this huge call from God. They're waiting for this big ministry. Peyton, there's people saying, I can't wait until God invites me to stand on stage and do that. But the thing is, while we wait for those moments, why don't we serve the Lord where we are? Look at what Samuel says. It says, the boy Samuel served the Lord. What do you know about Samuel other than that? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know. I, I don't know uh, his eye color. I don't know like what his, his favorite band is. I don't know where he wants to go on vacation. I don't know his hobbies. I don't know anything about this guy other than that he served the Lord. And listen to me, in a time when no one served the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
No one was serving the Lord. The, the priests were corrupt. The people were, were, were greedy and immoral. They were following their own path. But Samuel, no one was pushing him. There was not one person saying, Samuel, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm behind you. Like, I want to disciple you. I want to help you. No, he was by himself and he was serving the Lord. We've had no details except for that. He was, he was serving with this man named Eli, who is supposed to be God's representative on earth as the high priest. Eli had never heard a word from the Lord. Eli was, was, was one of the group. And so Samuel was by himself. He served the Lord. He didn't get paid for it. He achieved no fame. He earned no accolades. Hardly anybody knew his name. But you know what the name Samuel means? Anybody named Samuel in here? Really? That's your first name? I'm like, I know you read your name's not Samuel. Is that your first name? This is what the name Samuel means. The name of God. The name of God. So Samuel wasn't in it for the glory of his name. He was in it for the glory of God. Right? He, he said, it's not about what I achieve. It's about him. He served the Lord. If you want to make an impact, guys, if you want to, to see your friends and, and at school come to faith in Christ, you got to serve. You gotta serve, you can't sit there and be silent. It starts with a heart that says yes. It starts with a heart that says yes to serving the Lord. Make that your default response. Well, when God says, you know what, I want you to help take up offering. You guys have been awesome taking up offering this week. When God says, I want you to help take up offering, what do we say, church? Yes, yes, Lord, I'll do that. When God says, help set up tables and chairs for impact, we say what, church? Yes, Lord, I'll do that. When God says scrub the toilets at church, we say, yes. oh, that was it. Okay, all right. There's a little hesitant. You're like, uh, is it that one? Yes, yes, Lord. If you say that is your default response. Yes, Lord. If you learn faithfulness in the little things, when God comes to you to entrust you with something big, your default response on your lips has been, yes, yes, yes. yes. No one was pushing Samuel to serve the Lord. There were no trophies, no bonuses, no servant of the month awards. Samuel served the Lord because the Lord deserves to be served. Being faithful in little things. Listen, sometimes we've got to serve in places. Kenneth, you know this. Sometimes we've got to serve in places where nobody notices what you do. Amen. Tammy, I know you've been working so hard in the kitchen. I know you don't want me to put attention on you. Sometimes we serve in places where nobody notices and that's tough, but you know what? It's not about our name, it's about God's name and His glory. So if we want to make an impact in this place, in this community, you serve. You serve, and, and even in the places where nobody notices, people will be impacted. I will tell you, I remember my first grade Sunday school teacher. Her name was Miss Betty. She wore a bright red wig, and we knew it was a wig because it never sat right on her head. <laughs> She taught Sunday school for 450 years. She was, she was, she was there forever. I loved her. I remember her. I remember, I remember we would, we would mess with her and ask her difficult Bible questions. And, and she would also, she would always stop and say, well, I need to go talk to pastor about that. And she would come back. But I, she has no idea. She may not even be alive today. I lost contact with her up in Michigan, but it impacted me. It impacted me that somebody faithfully served over and over and over. This is how you impact your community and your world. You serve. There is a ministry. Every single one of us, there was a ministry with your name on it. Amen. It's not about sitting. Church is not. We've turned it into this experience where we sit and receive over and over and over. Get up and serve somewhere. And you guys say, but I'm a teenager. Where is there to serve? We'll find a place for you. Amen. We'll create a place for you. We'll, we'll do something. How about taking up offering? You guys enjoy doing that? You haven't been like taking any out of there, right? You didn't, you didn't count any of that. No. That, well, there's somewhere, there's somewhere, and it teaches us in, in the little things to be obedient and say yes to the Lord. Serve the Lord. Number two, I'm going to keep moving through here. The boy Samuel served the Lord. And here's the crazy thing in those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and prophetic visions were not widespread. God wasn't speaking. Why wasn't God speaking? Because people weren't listening. This is judgment from God. His silence was judgment. And so Samuel stood above his generation. He says, you know what? I'm going to serve. I'm going to listen. Number two, serve the Lord number one. Number two, stay in his presence. Stay in his presence. I want to show you the difference between a person who takes their faith seriously and a person who, like Brother Malcolm said on, on Monday night, is a spiritual moron. Okay. 
That was the first time I've ever heard a sermon like that. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about that. All right. If you weren't here, it makes no sense, but we'll post them on, online so you can watch. But look at this number two. I mean, verse two here. So let's look at this man, Eli. One day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. All right, this tells us a lot about him. It's not just his eyesight that's failing. It's his entire ministry. It's falling apart. This man stands before people like a pastor every single week and teaches them what it means to be a believer and what it means to follow God. And his two kids are the worst kids in all of Israel. And they, they're running wild. They're defaming the name of God. They're defiling the sanctuary. And in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, he comes to them and he's like, guys, don't do that. And do you think they listen to him? No. And so what, what does he do? He lets them run wild. His ministry is failing. He's supposed to be God's high priest. But look where he is. What does it say about him? His eyesight was failing. What was he doing? Mine says he was lying in his usual place. The Hebrew gives us a really interesting idea into what that means. It means he was where he was always lying. That means that this was the place where he planted himself. He was lazy and decrepit. He sat in his lazy boy recliner and watched the ball game and just let life go by. This is, this is the high priest. The guy that's supposed to be preaching and teaching and offering sacrifices for the people. And then we see in verse 3, Samuel. Look, at, he's in a completely different place. Look at him. Verse 3. Before the lamp of God, God had gone out. Samuel was lying down where? In the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was located. Listen, there were, there were rooms for the priests and for the temple workers. There were, there were bedrooms and places where they could go. Samuel said no to those places. He wanted to be in the midst of the tabernacle, in the midst of where everything was located. We know in the very middle of the, of the tabernacle was a curtained off room called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. That's where the Ark of God, where God's presence was. Now, he was not allowed to go in there, but Samuel says he was there right by where the Ark of God was located. He was laying down as close as he could get to the Ark of God. You know what that means? He was desperate for God's presence. He's like, I want to get as close as I can, even if everybody else is in a different place. I'm here, I'm planted in this place. You know what that tells us? When God finally spoke, he was the only one close enough to hear it. Amen. So look at this. What does this mean for me, though? Okay? So you guys today, you're like, does that mean I have to get a, a like a, you know, a, a, a tent and a sleeping bag and camp out in front of the pulpit and that will make me more holy? No, I tell you, that would be a horrible night's sleep. Recently, I slept uh, here in the church one night. And I got to tell you, it, uh, it was one of the worst experiences in my life. <laughs> I love this church, but man, it is creepy after dark. <laughs> there, are, there are things happening in this place. And frequently throughout the night, I was like, hello? <laughs> I know there's someone here. I know I hear you, man. I hear you breathing, but... So it's not, it's not about this. It's not about staying close to the pulpit. It's not about being here physically in this place. Because what Jesus did for you and me on the cross of Calvary, what he did, he offered forgiveness. He offered a chance to be renewed in your relationship with, with God. What that did is it made the presence of God not about a place. It made it about a person. So Samuel, if he wanted to worship the Lord, he needed to go to the temple. But today, you and I can go into the presence of Almighty God anytime in the world. Isn't that amazing? Guys, anytime, anytime. Do you think if I called President Trump right now, I've got his personal number. If I called him, would he pick up the phone for me? That hurts my feelings, but you're right, probably not. He wouldn't do it. I don't have his number, personal number either. The thing is, we, 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 we don't have access to anybody big. When we met the Irwins this week, Mindy and I were like, these are the most famous people we've ever met. This is, <laughs> this is amazing, right? But to think about in our situation, we can go to the God who created everything. And all it takes is opening His Word. The, the, the Word of God and prayer are not so much tools to be used, but they're doors to be opened anytime, anywhere in the worst of my situations, like Peyton said, in the winter of my life, I can go and I can open that door and I can say, God, I need, I need something right now. I need you right now. Stay in the presence of God. And when you do, it impacts people around you. I promise you, Moses met with God on top of Mount Sinai. And when he came down, what was going on with his face? 
He was glowing. He's like glow in the dark. He's like one of those one of those glow lights that you break, right? And the people were terrified. In Acts chapter four, Peter and John preached this message, and the religious leaders were like. I can't believe that. We've never heard anything like this. And it says that they recognize that they have been with Jesus. When you spend time in the presence of God, I promise you guys, you're going to make an impact on the people around you. So serve the Lord. You stay in His presence. Number three, you submit to His call. Submit to His call. Verse four, the Lord called Samuel. What does that tell us about the Lord? Is that He knew His name. God knows your name. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's known you before you were born. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were made in your mother's womb, I, I called you and set you apart. So here he says, the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. If you just ended right there, that would be pretty good. But then verse 5 says, he ran to Eli. He ran to the wrong guy. Uh, and said, here I am, you call me. He does that three times. I view this, if you guys remember... I don't know, we're, we're going back a little bit, but Abbott and Costello, you guys remember watching Abbott and Costello? Okay, you guys need to look it up, it's on YouTube, I swear. It's just goofy stuff, they did these comedy routines, and that's what this feels like. So, every time he's drifting off into sleep, he's like, Samuel, oh man, okay. And Eli's old, and he's almost blind, so he runs to him and says, Eli, what's, what's wrong? He's, he's waking him up. Eli, what's going on? What do you need? I'm right here. What do you need, man? And Eli's like, I didn't call you. You're dreaming. Go back to bed. If I was Eli, because this happens three times. If I was Eli, I gotta tell you, as I've gotten older, I value sleep a lot more than I used to. Like when I was 18, 19, when I was your guys' age, it's like I could stay up for 66 nights in a row and just do whatever, play video games and live on Mountain Dew. But now at, at, at my advanced age of 32, it, it takes a lot longer. To, and so if I was Eli this moment, I'd be like, Samuel, if you wake me up one more time, man, we're going to have word. This is not good. He didn't recognize the Lord's voice because the Lord hadn't spoken to anybody in a long time. Words from the Lord were rare. It says in verse 1. So finally he gets it. In church, you guys who are not youth and, and kids, you guys who are in the congregation back there, I want you to see this. This verse in verse uh, number 8. After he comes to him the third time, it says, Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. I want this to be our prayer. God, I want, I, want, I want you to call boys and girls, men and women, guys and girls. I want you to call them out of our church. And I want to have the spiritual sensitivity to be able to recognize that. There's a lot of people who look at people coming up in ministry and say, you've got to wait until you're a lot older to serve. Or, or, you know, looking at, like, worship leaders, I love, I love your, your false humility and, and some of that. I know it's not false, but... So, looking at it, I know there's moments when, when we hear music being sung by people who aren't the best. And you think, okay, let's, let's work on this a few years and then come back, right? I'm sure that's probably what we thought. But now you look at this and, and we need to look and say, kids that, that are, are willing to serve, man, God, call them up. Bring them up. Lord, pray for these people. He understood. He understood that God, that the Lord, it was the Lord calling to Samuel. And then we see Samuel's response here. I love it. Because he has said yes over and over and over to God. When God, finally, when, he, when it says the Lord came to him and, and spoke to him, Samuel, Samuel, right? What did he respond? What's verse 10 say? Speak. Speak. Your servant's listening. He had served before. He was a servant now. He had said yes so many times that he was ready when God was ready to speak to him. Listen, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something bold. I believe that right now, sitting in this room, I believe that a future pastor of First Baptist Church is, is sitting in this room right now. God has been impressing that on my heart for the last few months. Look, look around you. And you're like, I know it's not that guy. <laughs> I know it's like, it can't be him. I'm pretty sure I, I, I've known him for a while. Listen, he's here. He's here. And you know what stands between him and God's call in his life is for him to say yes. And it's not just the pastor. There are future deacons and missionaries and Bible teachers. There are future leaders. And all that stands between you and God's call in your life is just to say yes. Yes, yes Lord. Serve the Lord where you are in your context right now. Stay in His presence. Stick close to Him. 
And submit to his calling in your life. It is not glamorous. All right? I don't want you, like what, what Peyton does and what, what uh, Kenneth does and what I do, I don't want you to look and say, well, what a glamorous life that you lead. It's tough. When you step into ministry, you paint a target on your back. And Satan wants to bring you down. Listen to me. Samuel gets this calling and he says, yes, you know what the first thing that God calls him to do is? You read through the rest of chapter 3. He has to march back into Eli's room and call out his sin. 12-year-old boy to the high priest of all Israel. He has to look and say, God has judged your family. So God sometimes calls us into some, into some tough places, hard seasons, but it's worth it. Yes. Samuel had to go and he had to, to endure leadership in a, in a, in a uh, country that was immoral and walked away from the Lord. He had to see his people be destroyed in battle. He had to see them elect a, a horrible king, crown a horrible king, and watch him take his, his country down. He had to stand in front of the people in one chapter and condemn their idolatry. He is not being called into an easy life. But listen, this is what he was known for. You know what Samuel is known for in Scripture? He stood on a hill in a little town called Bethlehem, and he poured oil of anointing over a, a teenager named David. And he anointed him and crowned him to be the next king of Israel. And David led the people to victory. He led the people to hope and to healing and to renewed sense of, of direction and purpose in Israel. That was because Samuel said yes. Let me tell you a story. And this is where I'm going to end. I was, uh, when I was a teenager, I grew up, my, my parents are missionaries, so I grew up in a, in a ministry home. And my dad pressed my whole time growing up that, that I needed to go into ministry. And I said, no. I said, I don't want to do what my dad does. I, I, I want to I do that thing. I, I want to be as far as 17 year old. You're like, I, I don't want to look like my dad. I don't want to act like him. I don't want to do the same thing that he did. So I resisted the Lord for a long time. I got an opportunity when I graduated high school to go on a mission trip to Africa. I didn't care about the mission trip. I wanted to go on a safari, right? I wanted to go see animals. That was, that was what I wanted to do. And, and so that's why uh, I, I went. Before the trip even started, we flew into London on the way there. And we toured the city. We did a big four-hour tour of the city. And on the way back, I was sitting in the London Underground on the way to the airport. I sat there, and I felt so strong that I needed to pray. Have you ever felt that where it's just like, you just can't get away from God? And I sat there, and I remember looking up at the ceiling of this place, this, this train, and the, the London Underground. I looked, and I, I remember saying, God, what do you want from me? And it wasn't a, a nice little, here I am. I'm standing there, here I am, Lord. Your servant's listening. It was a, God, what do you want? Stop hounding me. About this, so I sat there and I just I was angry. I said, God, what do you want from me? And right about that time, I noticed the woman across the aisle had locked eyes with me. I was in London, I didn't know anybody. It was this old lady. I was like, What what is happening? So I'm thinking I had something on my face, and all the other people on my trip had fallen asleep. And so I was there alone, and I'm, I'm it'd be like 20 minutes, she was just locked eyes with me. And I'm thinking, what, what's going on? So I nudged our trip leader, Brenda, and I said, Brenda. And she said this, just ignore her. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Brenda. That's, that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna help. So I, I looked, I, in, I was 17. In my mind, I'm really, I, I very much concluded this woman is a serial killer. <laughs> she has scoped out this train. She has chosen me as her next target. I don't know what I did to deserve this, but this, this is where I am in my life now. So that train stopped at the at the airport and I bolted out that door as fast as I could. I don't look like it now but back then I was, I was in good shape but I looked I look like you man. I bolted out that train and I ran all of a sudden I felt a hand on my shoulder and I got turned around and it was that old woman and I looked at and, I, and I'm not I'm, I'm physically thinking I'm gonna die she looks at me and she says what does your t-shirt say I, I'm, I'm thinking what a weird thing to say before you kill it was, it was our trip t-shirt. It was our trip t-shirt, and it said, Discover the Cause. It was our mission trip t-shirt. So I told her, and she said, What is the cause for you? I, I, don't, I don't know. I had a lot of Sunday school answers in my head. But I looked at her, and I said, To tell people about Jesus. 
And she looked at me. Tears filled her eyes. She looked me right in the eyes and said, don't ever forget the cause. And she walked away. I sat there in the middle of Heathrow International Airport in London. I had just prayed, God, what do you want from me? And he spoke as clear as I'm speaking to you today. I want you to tell people about Jesus. Amen. I don't remember the rest of my trip. I think I went on a safari. I can't remember. <laughs> but I got back. I changed my plans. I changed the focus of my future. I went to Bible college. I jumped in full force. I just said, Lord, where do you want me? I will go. What you want me to do? I'll do it. He's taken me to some crazy places. And I've dragged Mindy along for the ride. We've ended up here. I want to tell you something. God is calling you to serve Him. Say yes. Say yes. And listen, just because if God, maybe God is not calling you into full time ministry, that's okay. It, it, uh, in fact, I, Brother Dennis said this this week. If you can do anything else, please do something else. <laughs> it's a tough life. It's not easy. All right. If God's calling you to do it, you, you won't be able to say no. You're going to say yes. But listen, God can use you wherever you are. Yes. He can use you in your classroom. He can use you on the football field. He can use you in your jobs. He can use you in your home. You are the perfect missionary that he has put in whatever context you're in. Mm -hmm. And it starts when you say yes. Say yes to the Lord. Hey, I'm going to ask you to come up and, and play for us, man. We have a time of invitation. We've had invitations every single night this week. This is the last one that we're going to open up. If you need this this evening, if you need to know Jesus as your Savior, if you have never made that choice to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to invite you to come. Just talk to me. I, I just want to explain to you. I'm going to ask Kenneth also to come up, if that's all right. Be ready to explain what it means to be saved. This morning, or this evening, if you, if you feel that God may be calling you into ministry to serve Him, I want to talk to you. I, I, want, to, I want to show you how it's worth it. How even the hard times are eclipsed by times like this that I get the privilege of sharing with you. If you need to come and pray at this altar, it will be open for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the story of Samuel who said yes. It cost him so much, but he said yes. And I pray, Lord, that if somebody is in this room that is battling with the sense of a calling into ministry, I pray that this tonight, this evening they would say yes I pray Lord that you would you would raise up leaders out of these the kids group and the youth group to impact not just man but this world for Christ Lord I know that the next pastor is here he's here Lord help us to identify them train them, disciple them, love them lead them and send them I ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who gave his life on Calvary for us.